So we're still sort of saying, well, maybe, you know, from an ultra short term perspective, the price has a little bit further to fall. Not a lot, you know, $40 maybe, maybe $60. But beyond the next week or so, we expect gold prices to start rising again. And again, December is an active contract month, but the political environment <clears throat> is going to factor in there a lot, uh, as will the economic environment. Good morning, it's Jeff Christian of CPM Group. It's not quite 10.30 on the morning of 11th October, Friday, um, here in New York. Got a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna try to go pretty fast here. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about silver and uh, solar panel use of silver, um, but there's been a lot of inflation data that's come out, US CPI, on Thursday, U.S. PPI today, this morning. Uh, I want to run through what, what's happening there with that data. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the gold and silver markets. As I speak, COMEX gold is around $2,666 for the December COMEX uh, futures contract. Um, showing a little bit of strength here, partly uh, in response to the better or lower uh, CPI and PPI numbers, which have increased market expectations that uh, there'll be more decline uh, reductions in the federal funds rate in November and December. Uh, silver is around thirty-one dollars and seventy cents. Platinum's around nine eighty-seven, and palladium has shot up to one thousand seventy-five dollars. Not quite sure what exactly is going on in palladium. I think there are probably some expectations or concerns uh, about supplies and about the potential of disruptions in, in Russian material. We don't expect uh, any disruptions in Russian palladium exports, but other people in the market seem to be concerned about that as the uh, hostilities between Russia and Ukraine and its uh, Western backers continues. Um, I want to talk a little bit about silver use in solar panels. There's a lot of information that's circulating. There's a lot of really wildly, overly bullish uh, projections about how much silver is going to be used over the next 10 years and beyond in solar uh, panels. Um, CPM Group has projections on that, and we do have it growing, but uh, the... Our expectations, which are based on the solar panel industry's uh, work, are far lower in terms of silver demand over the next 10, 10 years than some of the silver promoters and true believers and, and other people who talk about this stuff from a position of perhaps a less quantitative approach or less tied in with the actual solar panel industry. Now, the International Energy Agency just released this week its 2024 renewable study. It's about a 170-some-odd page report across renewables. The IEA is a real research organization. It is an organization that is paid to be right, not paid to be bullish or bearish, positive or negative. It's paid to deliver good information, accurate information, and credible projections for supply and demand of energy by various uh, sources of, and types of energy uh, over the future. Uh, their projections go out in this report to 2030, uh, but they have other reports that take their projections out to 2050. It's staffed by highly intelligent and competent technocrats, not by people promoting buy silver because the world's gonna collapse. Here's a link to this report. It's free, 170 some odd pages. You can download it in a PDF, you can read it. We have, uh, we're in the process of digesting some of its work, both on solar and on uh, the use of PGMs in the hydrogen industry. Uh, the IEA is broadly in agreement with us on both of those applications, but we wanna study it. Hopefully we'll do something more in the future, but. Just to tell you that that report's out there, if you really want to know what's going on in renewable energies 
including so, silver, uh, solar. They don't talk about silver apartment per se. They talk about the solar industry. The chart on the left here is the one I want to show you. And you can see, I hope you can see, various capacity utilization rates that they have projected through 2030. And the capacity utilization rates in the various componentry of the solar panels is falling. And it's basically falling to a range of 40 to 50 percent. That's not a healthy industry. That's an industry that has a tremendous amount of overcapacity. And you're already seeing that over the last few years. So people talk about silver use in solar panel manufacturing. And you have to take it the next step and say, okay, of those panels that have been manufactured, how many of them are being installed and how many of them are backing up in inventories? Because what we've seen is, yes, there were periods of time over the last couple of years where there was a lot of silver that went into solar panel manufacturing, but a lot of those panels, here you have a 50% overcapacity, a lot of those panels were lying in inventories unsold. And that robs silver from future demand because you won't be build, buying as much silver and building as many panels when you're selling panels that you've already manufactured that are built up in inventories. So that's one of the factors to pay attention to when considering what's the future trends of silver use. But I just wanted to touch on that, and I wanted to really tell you that this re report is out there. And if you want to really understand the renewables industries and silver use and, or the so future of solar panels and the future of hydrogen and the future of electrolyzers, um, which probably won't use platinum, and probably won't be a major industry, it's worth getting the report. Yeah, you know, various astute investors and people who are highly respected for their acumen in investing, Warren Buffett, for example, say, if you don't understand something, don't invest in it. So you can invest a weekend and read a 176-page book. Let's talk about inflation. This is the CPI through September. Month-to-month -month changes, 0.2%. Uh, so pretty much the same level that we've seen since July and down one. If you look at it on a year-over-year -year basis, the blue line are the headlines, uh, inflation including energy and food, which are more volatile. The brown line is what we call core inflation. It's all items, less food and energy. You can see that really the headline inflation has been declining very sharply over the last two quarters, really since March, we've seen a sharp decline that's almost entirely due to very sharp declines in petroleum prices and in petroleum product prices. CPI doesn't include petroleum. It includes gas. It includes uh, heating oil. It includes petroleum products that are used by consumers and bought by consumers. And it's very funny because I saw some political uh, campaign thing on television and this guy was talking about the 53% increase in gasoline prices. And yes, they did rise sharply and now they're falling sharply and they're at lo levels that we haven't seen for several years. But that has dragged down headline inflation. You can see 2.4% year over year. A lot of people are cheering that. But if you take out the volatile energy and food factors, and you look at the core, we've been kind of plateauing since around June, you know, in the 3.2, 3.3% range. And it's actually ticked up a little bit in the last month in September. I don't usually put these tables in there because I don't think that people can see them. But this is the table that shows the CPI by area. And you can see Again, really big declines, fuel oil off 22%, gasoline off uh, 15% on a year-over-year -year basis, um, energy commodities in general off 15%, uh, natural gas has been relatively flat, uh, um, but uh, relatively low. And you can see the big increases have been in services, other 
you know, non-food and energy commodities have actually been weaker in general, off of 1% from where they were a year ago. Eggs are rising, but other things are falling. New vehicles off 1%, you know, used vehicles off 5%. They're broken out because they're such a large portion of the consumer basket. The CPI is an index take, uh, of, of a survey of several thousand people spread across the country who fill out forms every month saying, this is what I bought this month, this past month, and this is what I paid for it. So all this talk about the CPI not really being representative is based on ignorance of what the CPI really is. The CPI is actually a composite of surveys of actual consumers around the country, across the country. And you can see here that non-food and energy commodities, what they call commodities, goods, goods, off about 1% year over year, about 0.2% as the chart showed, a month to month. And the increases, the, the place where we're seeing persistent inflation is in shelter, housing, rent costs, and the cost of owning a home, so your mortgage and your utilities and your taxes, shelter services, and transportation services. That's where we're seeing sticky inflation. The rest of the economy, relatively less inflationary right now. So you put that all together and you put it in a historical context, and you can see how post-COVID, we had a big spike up to about 9% in consumer price index, and it came down quickly, and it's continued to dwindle down to a point where it is pretty much where it was at the top of the range prior to the COVID lockdown. And it's pretty much in line with the inflation that we've seen for most of the time from 1983 until um, the Great Recession putting it in uh, the, uh, the current inflation figures in context, you would have to say that that spike to 9% was in fact transitory as defined by economists, not politicians and demagogues. Looking at PPI, the producer price index, again, it's the energy prices that have plunged that has caused that headline to come down. If you look at uh, final demand X energy, it's been kind of flat. It is relatively lower than it had been in 2021, early 2022, and it is trending slightly lower, right? That energy price uh, decline masks a more modest decline in overall uh, producer inflation. And here's the data. Again, it's showing you the same thing. You know, for example, total the index for total demand for final goods, as opposed to services, off negative 2%. But if you break it down, that energy was off 2.7%, and foods were up a percent, and everything else was up 0.2%. So that 0.2% decline in total uh, costs for our goods is really a function of the lower energy prices. You look at final demand for services, 0.2 again, and it's pretty much flat all over. So we are seeing, in, in the case of producer prices, a flattening out, 0.3% is still pretty high, uh, in transportation inflation. Again, putting it into a historical context, we had that big burst in 2021 and early 2022. Since early 2022, the uh, producer price inflation has come back down to pre-COVID levels. That's what I have on that. Turning to gold and silver. Gold prices are close to record levels. They have come off from $2,700. Uh, again, we're looking at the December COMEX futures contract. Uh, we thought that the price could come off a little bit on profit-taking. We thought that any such profit-taking probably would extend through this week and that by the time you got into next week, we would be in that run-up-to-election mode 
where we would start seeing more upward pressures on gold prices and silver prices again. Um, the profit taking, there still may be some profit taking in these markets. So we're still sort of saying, well, maybe, you know, from an ultra short term perspective, the price has a little bit further to fall. Not a lot, you know, $40 maybe, maybe $60. But beyond the next week or so, we expect gold prices to start rising again. And again, December is an active contract month. But the political environment is going to factor in there a lot, uh, as will the economic environment. There are people, there are more and more signs to say that a recession may be later rather than sooner and less severe than it is. You know, forget the demagogues waving their arms saying that the U.S. economy is going to collapse. The economic data is better. Inflation figures are coming down. Interest rates probably will be coming down. All of that kind of suggests um, a stronger economy, and a stronger economy suggests stronger gold prices. And as you extend the economic recovery that's been in place now for four years, people who have a lot of profits in their stocks and bond market investments are increasingly nervous and looking to diversify their portfolios by adding some gold and even some silver. And we've seen that on a global basis this year, and we're seeing it continue, and we're starting to see other groups like U.S. and North American institutions, family offices, join into that group. Beyond the next week or so, we do think we're going to see higher prices. Very similar in silver, although we're not at record levels. Uh, we have gotten up to around $33 uh, briefly a couple times over the last month or so. Price has backed off. Uh, you know, I said it's $31.70. It has the potential to back off further. We wouldn't be surprised to see that in the next day or two. But we think that as October proceeds, you'll see a reduced probability of further profit-taking driving prices down. And instead, you'll see uh, investors pivoting toward a longer position. In both gold and silver, investors, both physical and in futures and options, investors are heavily long right now. And they're probably going to continue to be heavily long. There are any number of people who say, you know, this is too long and we should see profit taking. Our expectation is that the investment community will probably go further long over the next several weeks going into the uh, election and, and past election. I won't bore you with our views on the election. Um, again, one of the things that we have been saying, and we I will repeat this, is the post-election period is going to be perhaps more important than the pre-election period. That's all I have for now. Uh, you can go to our website. You can buy some of our research. You could read other free research that we have posted there. We just posted today, or actually last night, a special market report called The Real Reasons to Invest in Silver Now. And it focuses on investment demand for silver. It's a free market commentary, and it is sponsored by Silvercorp which said, we think this is an important piece of information and analysis to get out to investors and to the broader silver market. 